All right. Shall we start? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to my talk about uh, software metrics in practice. Um, let me introduce myself first. Um, uh, je m'appelle Sébastien. That's all I can say in French. <laughs> um, I'm Polish, but I've lived in Sheffield in the UK for, for over six years now, I guess. And I've been involved in any sort of software development for over 12 years now. Uh, mainly PHP, but I did a little bit of Java and uh, C++ and all sort of different scripting uh, languages. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, automation and, uh, and continuous integration, and I'd really love to automate anything that I do at work. And in fact, I really hate doing any manual jobs. Um, when I'm not uh, busy, uh, like visiting castles and medieval places and things like that, I usually contribute to, to different open source projects, uh, namely PHP Unit, for example, or Osona, uh, which I will be actually talking about a little bit later on. Um, you can find me on Twitter. This is my username. So if you've got any comments or questions or you feel shy to do it in here, don't hesitate to do it on Twitter or speak to me afterwards. I've got only 40 minutes, so we will be very quick. So if you, have, if you want me to talk to you about any sort of additional stuff of software metrics or, or, or development process in, in general, then uh, feel free to, to speak to me in person afterwards. I will definitely be hanging around. Um, what I will be talking today about uh, will be software metrics, but more in terms of something involved with coding and design. And this is mainly because I've been focused recently more in finding ways of automate, uh, not automating, but um, finding ways of improving um, development processes and making sure that whatever I'm developing or my team is developing, it's, it's being done in, um, with top level quality. Hence my special interest in, in software metrics and in the Sonar project. Um, so what I will not be talking about is any sort of stuff related to project management. So if you want to learn how to, I don't know, track the progress of your project or how to meet your deadline, this is not going to be a talk about this kind of stuff. Um, but actually, before I start, I, I'm really, really interested in how many of you actually have used any sort of software metrics so far, or used tools that can help you actually track any sort of uh, things within, within the code, okay? Um, for, for many years, and I don't think it's only me, um, people have been tracking or have been looking at code from a completely different perspective and have been measuring the quality of, of the code completely differently. Uh, which I basically named, they've been counting number of WTFs per minute. If you don't know what WTF means, I'm not going to spell it out today in here. So for the purpose of, of this conference, let's just assume that means worse than failure. Um, and the problem with this kind of measurement is basically that you can only tell that something is wrong when somebody actually speaks up. And, and it's usually not a very kind language. Um, but you can't really tell what is wrong, because the only way to find it out is to come over to a developer and ask him or her what's gone wrong. And they're probably speechless at this point. So any sort of reporting is, is basically impossible to do that. And what you really need to know is, first of all, what's wrong, and how can you fix it? Um, there is another metric which is kind of very similar to this one, which is the swear count. So there have been a few passes out there that you can basically do some kind of static analysis of the code that it will count every single swear word in your code. And there's been kind of a competition between different projects, which got more than the other and things like this. 
You could probably do a little bit more reporting on that, but it's still not very, very efficient. What I'm really after is if I measure something, I need to really know what happened and, most importantly, how to fix it. So that's what I've been looking for. And that's why I more looked into scientific methods of measuring the code quality. So I found something like this. And I got very, very confused, because there is a lot of acronyms over there which don't really mean anything if you, if you first of all, don't know what they stand for, and secondly, if you, don't, if you can't put them into any sort of context. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of them. That's plenty of them. We don't have time. But what I'm going to talk about is some of them that I personally found the most useful, and then I think you could apply them in your daily work and kind of benefit from them and improve your own development processes or your own coding styles and things like this. Um, what I want to make sure that we are on the same page and that everybody actually understand what is the metric, and it doesn't have to actually apply to software at all. So when you think about metric, this is something that you try to describe at some kind of a way, and this can be anything that you can think of, and you can describe with anything that you can think of as well. So this could be like what it basically says is a characteristic of an entity, and the characteristic or an entity is, it could be you. It could be the screen, it could be the room, whatever you think of. And, and the characteristic is how you describe it, so whether it's a, it's a weight or width or color or, or something like this. But there are two very important things. You have to be able to apply any sort of numerical value to this description. And secondly, use a very common unit. So you can't compare something which you could describe as, I don't know, 30 centimeters long and 30 meters long. They just don't go together. And finally, when you talk about metrics, you need to understand why you are measuring something and what are your goals. What are you trying to achieve by measuring that? So there are two different things when you talk about metrics that you could measure and what are the reasons why you're measuring it. First of all, it's, it's the design and how the software has been designed actually from the first place. And this can actually help you assess the software size, its complexity, um, and its quality at every single point of the development cycle. We're talking about probably a brand new project here. So you start a project, you know what you need to do, and you need to make sure that along the way, how it goes is all top-notch. It's top quality code that you're producing. But you have to understand that there is no magic metric. Uh, metric. I will not give you a metric which will give you a single number, which will tell you, I don't know, 100, and then you will know, yeah, my software is fine, and I will tell you that it's completely wrong. There is no such a metric. The thing with metrics, you have to think about them as a tool, as a guideline. This is something that it's more trying to help you understand what could be potentially wrong with your software. And then, taking it from there, you can start applying some changes to make it better. And it can be very, very misleading if you don't read your metrics right, uh, because uh, good metrics don't necessarily mean the software is good. And on the other hand, bad metrics doesn't mean that your software is crap and you have to start changing it. This is only the starting point for you. The metrics are actually showing you, right, dude, there is something wrong in here. Please have a look at this, and then you decide whether you have to do something with it. But it's not only the brand new code that you probably want to measure. It's also the legacy systems. And we all know how it is hard to deal with legacy systems. And um, because this is basically old and usually decaying software. And it doesn't matter whether it's because of nobody actually knows what's going on in there, because half of your team left, and half of the expertise of the team left, and you can't tell why some things has been done in the first place. But it could also, could also be because of the size of the code. It could be of its complexity, or 
because of the fact that it's been patched over the years. And you really need something automated to be able to actually cruise through the code and give you those, those points where you can start your investigation and actually start thinking about what you should do. You could also use the metrics if you're, for example, in a consultancy business. So you go some, or somebody approaches you, to, for example, to ask you for help in paint, maintaining software or to, to do some audits and things like this. And this is a perfect thing to, to have a quick look at something that will tell you what you're, look, what you're really looking at and can, make, can help you make a decision what to do next. Let's have a look at some basic metrics first, the, uh, the easiest stuff. So these are the, the list of the metrics that allow you to describe the size of your software. And you could see them in all sorts of different tools. I'm going to talk about tools in a minute. So when you talk about size, uh, you, can, you can approach it from different angles. So first of all, you could, for example, measure the number uh, of lines of code in your software. But the, the code, the line of code is not the same. And you could measure different things. So we could measure like the total number of codes. And it doesn't matter what the code does. And this is the LOC metric, lines of code. But then you could be more interested in the code that is actually executed or the code that is actually the comments. And you've got for that different metrics, which is uh, E log for executable lines of code and C log for comments. But then you can take it a little bit further and you can start counting things like number of packages in the given piece of software or number of classes or number of methods or generic functions. And that's what you've got for uh, the NOP, NOC, and NOM uh, metrics. So this is the size. The, the other bit is the complexity. And this is actually the, the interesting bit, because this is something that can start help you understand where the risks can be in your software where it is really risky to change something because it can basically blow up. And there is a metric called cyclomatic complexity, which basically is a metric that counts every single decision point in your code. And by doing that, it will give you some kind of a number that you can start using in terms of start to understanding where is that code that could be really, really hard to understand. And it's actually very, very simple because all it does it counts every single conditional statement in your code. So stuff like if statements or while statements or for loops and things like that. Um, this metric is actually very, very old. And it's um, a guy called Thomas McCabe came up with the definition of this metric back in 1976. So it's been there longer th than me in this world, uh, which is really, really impressive. Over time, they actually found out that the, the, the first definition of this metric actually didn't take into account every single possible uh, conditional statements. So they found out they, that um, it doesn't take into account the logical operators like AND or X or and things like this. So then a second version of this metric has been introduced, and its common abbreviation is CCN2. And this is the most widely adopted metric and tools like PHP unit or PHP that P depend actually using it. But there is another thing that is maybe not broken, but missing from this. And this is the fact that the metric has been introduced in the times where the procedural languages were used mostly, and OOP wasn't actually there yet as such. And with object-oriented languages, there is obviously um, a case of exceptions which basically introduces another uh, conditional thing, while when you think whatever is between the try and catch statements is the regular execution of the code. So, so, the, first, so the third and complete version of the code actually takes into account all of these um, conditional statements. Now, I got a little example in here, although I'm not going to go through every single iteration, so it's more about you actually seeing how it looks in the real life. So, this is everything, well, some of the most common used conditional, um, conditional statements, and basically every single one you count as one. Uh, the very important thing that it is about cyclomatic complexity, a method that's got no conditional statements whatsoever inside, it all, always counts as one. 
So even if you don't have it there, your cyclometric complexity is one. But also, you might have noticed that the L statement is actually not counted. And this is simply because it doesn't introduce an, ad an additional decision path. This would be executed no matter what, whether the if statement would be there or not. Now, nobody actually um, expects from you to, to do all this counting manually. Uh, why I wanted to show you that, it's more to raise your awareness. So every single time you put an if statement in your code, you increase complexity. And that's what I kind of want to get away from this talk, for you to think about whether putting another if, and another if, and another for, and another if, and most, and <clears throat> And you can make it work if you get it if you get it nested. This is increasing the complexity very, very quickly. So there is a tool which is called PHP Lock, which was developed by Sebastian Bergman. Very simple software, doing a, a um, static analysis of a code and giving you all those metrics fairly, fairly quickly. You can just install it using Pair Manager basically, and then you start having all those values about how big the software is, and about classes, and, and methods, and the complexity, and so on, and so on. But when you look at these numbers, there's one problem. It's really, really hard to say what they really mean. They are they just numbers. And how do you tell whether, I don't know, 5,000 lines of code, it's big or not? Or whether, I don't know, 10 classes, or a method with 50 lines of code is big or not? And there are thresholds that can help you understand what these numbers basically mean. So these thresholds, for example, are more for the complexity. So if you get code or piece of code, that's usually probably a method that you measure. The complexity between one and four, this is a very low complexity, so probably nothing to be worried about a lot. Uh, numbers between five and seven is the average, average complexity. When you get into numbers between eight and ten, this is when you have start when you have to start worrying. This is when you probably need to look at it and start refactoring your code. Above eleven, it's maintenance hell basically. You will don't know what is going on. It will be very hard to test. It will be very hard to predict what's going to happen with this kind of a code. About the size metrics, there are different thresholds. You've got some examples in here. Some of the thresholds in here and in here, they've been actually developed based on analysis of some most, um, of some open source software, and they've been actually done for code written in Java and C++. What is very important in that case is to be aware of that depending on the language that you use, the thresholds will be different. And this is simply because you use different um, different ways of, of writing the software. They, they are different um, coding habits and started and so on and so on, since the differences. You can get the complexity even further. And there are two additional metrics that help, can help you look at the complexity from more method level and the class level. So you've got WMC, which is weighted method count. And this gives you the total complexity of a class. And you also get the average method weight, which is the average complexity of a method in the piece of software that you're actually analyzing. And again, you've got different thresholds that will tell you what they actually mean. Uh, and they, again, different for different languages. Uh, but if you get, if the WMC metric is getting basically above 50, this is where the class is very, very complex. And that's when you need to start looking at it and see whether you, have to, you can do anything to, to make it basically better and less complex. Now, the next thing I want to measure is the coverage report. You must have seen a very similar report in the Rasmus talk. How many of you seen this or generated that in your life? I would expect a little bit more people. Um, right, so this, oh, how many of you guys are actually writing unit tests and using unit tests for testing your software? That's not a lot either. OK. Uh, this basically, using unit testing, you can, ex you can see how much code has been executed and it's been successfully executed. That's how you can test your software. And you can generate this kind of a report, which will basically tell you 
how much of the code in terms of, for example, the class or the method of per line of code has been actually executed and tested. But even some people that actually use this, the report on a daily basis are not aware of an additional method that is there, which is called CRAP. Um, well, it's not CRAP. It's CRIP, really. And it stands for Change Risk Analysis and Prediction. And this is the metric that can help you predict how risky it will be to change a given piece of software, which is really, really useful. Uh, the formulas for that is a little bit more complicated. But in short, what you can tell, it takes into account the cyclomatic complexity which I've talked about before and the coverage report because there is kind of a relation between them too. And basically, if the number is getting very, very high, that means that either your, your code is not really tested very well and the coverage is really low, or, or maybe and, the complexity of your code is very, very high. Therefore, you can guess it's very, very hard to do anything with this code without introducing any, any sort of unintended changes or unintended behaviors. If your coverage is 100%, um, you're actually in quite a good position because it will be quite safe to change the code to refactor it because it means with high numbers of CRIP index, it basically means that the code is very, very complex. But because you are backed up with the unit tests and with the coverage, you can actually quite safely change it because it will quickly tell you that you've broke something or not. Um, you're really in trouble if the code coverage is going towards zero because that you have no help from anywhere to actually validate that whatever you're trying to do to bring the index down that can tell you that actually it's still working as it was supposed to work before. There is this matrix <clears throat> that can help you basically understand where you're getting into kind of a red zone, where it's very risky, but in a Basically, if the number of the CRIP index is above 30, this is where you're, trying to, where you're getting into the, the area when you have to start thinking about reducing the complexity or introducing unit tests to, to make sure uh, it all, uh, all the changes are actually fine. Now, there is one problem with cyclomatic complexity. And it is the fact that it doesn't take into account um, that different conditional statements are actually harder to understand. It doesn't take into account either that nesting the conditional statements, it makes it even harder to read. So therefore, another metric has been introduced, which is called NPATH. And this is kind of trying to address all those issues. And NPATH metric is, is actually tackling the problem for a completely different angle and is actually trying to count all the acyclic execution paths in your code. And if you don't know what that means, you can loosely translate it to how many unit tests you have to write to cover in 100% the piece of software that you're measuring it. And, and you can clearly uh, see it from the... Um, from the formula. So basically, it's like a Cartesian product of every single statement. But the formulas for different conditional statements are different because they take into account the fact that you, it will be harder to understand one or another or that, that it will be nested, basically. So again, there is another example like this, which is a little bit simpler. Uh, but what I want to show you is really that it can be different depending of of the conditional statements in here, or for example, the logical operator in here. Um, if you want to, because we don't have enough time to do it right now, uh, if you want to learn about how it actually calculates that, we can meet at the hall and I can show you all of that. It's actually pretty interesting and it gives you even more awareness what happens if you combine them in, in all sorts of different uh, mixes and, so, and stuff. And again, because it's even harder to count that all, it's, it, you will spend more time. I don't really expect you to, to do it manually, and there are tools for that. So one of the tools is PHP Depend. How many of you heard about PHP Depend or used it? Okay. Uh, the tool is basically doing a static code analysis, but it does that far, in a far, far more advanced manner than PHP Lock, and it actually spits out 
an XML report with all sorts of different metrics. Not only what I've said uh, today, there is a lot more that you can actually, that you can actually see it in there. And, but if you're not really into reading XML reports, and they can get quite big if, you, if your code is really big, uh, then there is another tool which is called PHP Mass Detector. How many of you heard about this one? Okay, about the same number of people. This kind of works on top of PHP Depend and makes it easier to understand what PHP Depend actually is trying to tell you. So it's kind of speaking in a more human language and tells you what is wrong. And in some cases, it actually tells you how you could fix it. So it can tell you about the complexity because of its, it's too high, and it takes into account both cyclomatic complexity and NPATH. But it also can tell you that your method, methods are really growing and are really, really overloaded. And then it will tell you, right, you need to do something about it because the bigger the methods, the harder it will be to understand it. Um, it also can tell you very uh, uh, useful stuff like having methods with parameters which never have been used. So we can clean up your code and make it even easier to understand. Now, coming back to PHP Depend, it generates another report, which I found much more useful. The first time I actually seen it, it was when I started using PHP under control, but in time to use it as a continuous integration server. And the, the graphs looked amazing, but hardly nobody knew what they meant, apart from the pretty colors being on the screen and looking funky. Um, so I kind of dig into it a little bit more to try to understand what it means. The very, very big advantage of this report, that I'm going to show you how it looks actually in, in full glory, is that this is something you could present to management, because metrics are not only for developers, or they actually shouldn't be only for developers. This should be something that you could present to your managers, that you could explain them in a way that they can understand that something is wrong with what you're doing, whether it's a software that you're writing from scratch or whether this is something that you're maintaining. So let's have a look at this. So we've got the report basically um, describes or tries to describe a software from three different structural aspects. And this is size and complexity, the coupling, and inheritance. And when you talk about size and complexity, we kind of falling back again to the same metrics that I talked to you about at the very, very beginning. So we basically put all those basic size metrics of complexity on the graph with the numbers next to it. But this we already went through, like PHP log already did that. So it doesn't give you a lot of information when you look at this like this. Most importantly, the purpose of this graph is to be able to compare different projects and tell you a little bit more about, for example, which one is more complicated or which one will will make you spend more time maintaining it. So what you have to do is to kind of make some kind of relation between those metrics. And that's what it does. It comes up with four additional metrics, which can tell you how the software is structured in terms of how well it is packaged. And it, this metric will tell you that, how many classes on, in general per package you have in the software how big the classes are, whether they're not really overloaded because they've got a lot of methods in there, or whether your methods are not too big, or the cyclomatic complexity per line is not too big. Uh, then if you get into the coupling section, this can tell you, this actually introduces two new metrics, which is calls and fan out. And both of them are trying to describe the coupling between different parts of your systems. The calls one is basically the number of distinct uh, operation calls, whether it's a method or is a global function or something like that. But this is the user methods and user functions, so it doesn't take into account any sort of libraries or third parties or framework or whatever you're using. This is software that's been introduced by you. And Fano is kind of similar, but instead of counting these relations between methods, it takes into account classes. But again, these are pure numbers. They don't really tell you much unless you make any sort of relation. And if you look, and if you use the number of methods to come up with two additional metrics, it will give you a little bit more broad vision of the software. Because what will tell you, it will give you additional metric in here which will tell you about um, coupling intensity. So 
on average how many methods or how many operations are called within a different method and coupling uh, dispersion in terms of um, how many classes are actually being referenced in this coupling from a different class, basically. And finally, the, the inheritance bit, which is, which is basically telling you how, how well software implements the object-orientedness principles, basically. An additional two metrics, one being ANDC, which is an average number of derived classes, and AAH being average hierarchy height. Well, they basically tell you the top one, it gives you the average number of subclasses of a, different, of a specific class, while the second one gives you the average number of classes when you count them from a very root class to a very uh, subclass that you've got in the whole inheritance tree. So this is how the pyramid looks all together with all the numbers. It introduced some colors to let you understand what the numbers actually mean in terms of the thresholds, so you can understand whether this is something that means good or bad. Um, and this is actually a very interesting example, because when you start analyzing it, you will see some, some, some very interesting stuff. This graph, I think, I generated for Symfony 2 framework. And you can see, if you look at the size of all the stuff in, uh, in Symfony, it's actually quite well maintained, so the packages are fairly small. The classes and the methods are quite, they're not big, but they're not too small, so it's kind of that you can maintain quite well. And the complexity is very, very low, actually. So then you go on to the, the other side of the diagram in here, and you look into the coupling section, and then you can think like, right, okay, so we've got the first warning sign in here. Very, very uh, big number in terms of the coupling um, intensity. So you can guess that there is probably a lot of methods being called from the other methods. So you could think like, now, okay, maybe I need to go and change that. But this is where you think wrong. This is about not trying to fix something so the metric looks okay and is getting green or getting gray in that case. It's more about understanding where, whether there is any valid reason that this metric looks like this. And there is. Because when you look at the second metric in here about how the coupling is dispersed across the software, you can tell that this is, those coupling stuff is fairly localized. So it's probably only between few classes. And this suddenly starts to make sense because it's a framework, so we can expect there is a few components, and the interaction within the component could explain why the coupling intensity is so high. And then suddenly when you start looking at the inheritance metrics, it again starts to make sense. In here, that actually says it's in an average, but when you look at the, at the thresholds that you could use a reference, they actually get quite into the, the high threshold. But that, again, if you think about framework, well, you would expect a high inheritance implementation in there because the code is meant to be reused. So it definitely makes sense in that case. Right, a few minutes left to talk about Sona, which I mentioned at the very, very beginning. And that's where I get very, very excited. I've been involved in the Sona project for, for a couple of years, I think. Um, the Sonar has been actually, uh, how many of you actually heard about Sonar? A lot, more than about unit tests, amazing. Um, so um, initially, Sonar was developed as a tool to, to track um, uh, the quality of your code in terms of detecting different violations or using also different metrics to tell you whether something is wrong or not. But with time, initially it was only for Java, then additional plugins was developed, to, and in the meantime, the PHP plugin was developed as well. So what it actually tells you, it shows you all those different methods in terms of dashboards. And this is, again, I think this is the perfect software to use in terms of um, showing the business how well you're performing in terms of maintaining software or working on software because it gives you all those size metrics about lines of codes and size of classes and detecting duplications, amazing stuff. 
initially it was, it was able to detect code duplication within your project. With the one of the recent versions, it can do cross-checking between different projects and tell you this code is duplicated somewhere over there. So we can start working on reducing the duplication between projects and, I don't know, maybe separating them into, into some kind of libraries. And then you've got the complexity, the same thing that you get from PHP unit about code coverage and the number of tests that's been successful or failed. And the thing is about Sona or the PHP plugin for Sona is it's actually reusing all those tools that I've been mentioning so far. And you can run it in kind of two modes where you can make the tools to execute on top of your code and generate the reports. But you can also run the tools as part of your continuous integration platform, generate the reports, and then feed them back into Sona, which is much more performance-wise better process. And the other thing is, which is very good, at every single point in here, you can actually dig in and look at the code. It's got a very tight integration with um, version control system. So then you can see actually who has written the given piece of code. And you can either chase a person then has done something wrong with it, or you can see whoever, for example, fixed something. Um, there's another dashboard that will tell you about all the violations. So it's using PHP code sniffer. Uh, to do that, and it actually so shows you all the stuff that PHP mass detector was reporting before, but in, in terms of this nice dashboard. And again, you can dig into the code and actually see it, what's exactly wrong with it. Um, finally, I want to mention about two plugins. There is a lot of plugins, a lot of very, very good plugins for Sona, which can extend all the visuals of that and give you even more information about the quality of your code. So this is a plugin which is called SIG uh, Maintainability Model, which was developed by Software Improvement Group. And it kind of, again, takes exactly the same metric that we've been talking so far about size, complexity, and kind of tries to put them all together. And it comes up with kind of four top-level metrics, which can allow you to basically describe the software in terms of analyzability, um, uh, changeability, uh, testability, and stability. And it kind of uses, um, it can rate it from very bad to very good. It basically uses this kind of two minuses, minus zero, plus, double plus, to rate it. And then finally, it puts that on this nice little spider to combine them all and give you even a, a top level view on that. And even the color means something, because if it's green, it means it's all right. If it's red, it means something that you probably need to look at. And the second plugin, which is technical that, uh, per name, it can actually tell you the percentage of technical debt that you introduced into your code. And it can actually show you that from t different angles, being at the percentage of technical debt. And the way it calculates it, it can actually allow you to compare to different projects to say how much percentage of technical debt is in your project, which is very, very important because it depends how big your project is. 10% of small project is not the same as on the large project. But then you can actually express it in the monetary value. So you could say how much it actually will cost you to clear all the debt. And by clearing that, it would be removing the duplications, uh, making it more testable, uh, increasing the coverage, reducing uh, complexity, removing the violations, and so on and so on. And further on, it can kind of give you a high number of man hours that you will have to invest into doing that. It's all configurable, so we can actually tweak it however it actually suits in your company. Uh, recently, another very, very good plugin has been introduced, and it's been within the past few weeks, I think, so I don't have a, uh, any slide to show you that, but it's been called Developer Cockpit. You can actually see the involvement of single developers into the code quality of the project so we can see how many of them, for example, introduced the valuation or has fixed the unit stats and so on and so on. So summarizing, what I want you guys to get out of this is to understand that the metrics are the tool for you to use it to investigate how good your software is or track the progress while you're developing it to make sure that you don't actually introduce any bad code. I don't want you guys to start using metrics and work towards them. I've seen that so many times, 
specifically, for example, with unit tests and code coverage, that people were doing everything they can to get into the 100% coverage mark, which is rubbish, because what they were doing, really, is, well, they're just making it look pretty and not testing anything whatsoever. So you have to really think about it in terms of, right, this is telling me that this bit of code is very complex. I'll probably look at it right now and make it lower so it's actually easier to understand and so on. Um, there is a few resources that you can look at. So these are the websites, basically. Uh, Manuel Pichler, who is the author for uh, PHP Dependent PHP Mess Detector, is actually blogging, and the PHP Depend site is talking a lot about metrics and how actually PHP Depend has implemented them, so we can learn a lot from that. Um, but what I want to point to it is, as well, this book. I'm not getting any commission on that, to be clear. But this is the book that I've learned a lot of the stuff from, and I'm really covering like the top of the iceberg in, uh, in here. I'm really talking about the basics, and it can give you even more about metrics and about how it actually applies to your daily job and how you can tackle some of the problems that you find when you start using metrics and make you a better developer. Uh, a few thank yous in terms of the graphics that I use, so if you want to have a look who's done them, that's, that's the link. And, and there is a final metric for me, 6445 on joined in, so if you got any feedback for me, any questions, or you want to tell me whether I missed something or you expected something completely different from the stock, please let me know via this. Thank you very much. So I guess there are some questions. Uh, yeah. Um, talking about metrics and the question of the continuous integration. Mm -hmm. Now you are saying I should not enforce certain thresholds, but if I'm using a continuous integration server, I should also enforce uh, certain metrics like um, the code coverage 70% or whatever to really see that my build fails or something. But what you are saying now is to not really look at it and do it on a basis which I have to decide personally. Kind of. Uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding, I guess, around continuous integration because we've been using all those tools to generate all those reports and when using Jenkins, you can see it all there. That's not what continuous integration platform is for, really. It is there to allow you to integrate different pieces of your software into one and then to run tests on top of that. Yes, Jenkins and all the CI platforms can give you some basic metrics, but that's not their job. This is kind of an additional benefit. Sona works on top of that, and it actually perform, performs the analysis afterwards, and it gives you all sort of reporting on top of that, which Jenkins is not able to do for you, for example, simply because it basically generates the XML reports, and you will hit the barrier of having several XML reports, which are then being combined into one, and you start getting into performance issues, and so on, and so on. So what I'm talking to you about you can run all those tools from CI if you want. You can look at the results. That's fine. That's up to you. It really depends at which point you want to look at those metrics. I would encourage you to look earlier. So kind of CI fits into this scenario, especially that you can make CI, and that's how I've got it configured, is that I run all those tools. I get the coverage reports. I've got all the violations and stuff like that. And then as part of the CI job, I basically execute the sonar analysis, and that gives me the full picture that I can investigate on a much higher scale. I didn't mention that stuff, actually. I completely missed that. But if you look at the dashboard, there is a very interesting stuff. You, you see these arrows. Over time, it will tell you how you're performing, whether you're in, introducing new violations, whether you're reducing them, and things like this which is really, really good. There, I don't think I have it on those screens, but there is also kind of a drop-down list which you can compare yourself against different analysis. And it will tell you, for example, how many, whether you reduced or introduced additional coverage only in the new code, things like this. You will never get this from the CI environment, basically.
I um, I have basically two questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is. Um, Is there some kind of metrics that look like uh, the C here AP metrics, but with n pass? Can you say it again? The, um, you know the, the metrics that uh, was combining uh, coverage, test coverage, and uh, co cyclomatic complexity. Is there one which use in pass and test coverage? I, I talked about that. This is the C or AP index, which takes into account both of them. So yes, on, yes, yes, but um, it uses cyclomatic complexity instead of n pass. Oh, you're talking about n pass itself. Uh, no, I know that the guys at the Sona are actually working on some kind of a, a specific dashboard that will actually give you a little bit more information about the n pass complexity in terms of uh, instead of cyclomatic complexity. Okay. Um, the second one is uh, PHP is introducing uh, functional programming stuff, like you can use Clojure and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, and most of the metrics you showed here um, reflects object-oriented um, yes. uh, stuff. So, is there some? Uh, how, how does this metrics adapt to functional programming stuff? And uh, And is there also metrics? I, or, uh, I know where you're going with that. So yeah. there is a few drawbacks in terms of PHP, and simply because it's, it's a very dynamic language. So we can do all sorts of stuff, and you can detect some of the stuff. So for example, one of the metrics that it's kind of we're not having in PHP is lack of cohesion, LCOM4, which you might have come across. And I've seen, I've spoken to Manuel Pickler about that, and it's very, very hard to generate that for PHP, basically, simply because of how it works. And this will be the same thing for closures and for this kind of stuff, simply because of the dynamism. Uh, you will not be able to come up with the metric which will reflect that very, very well. I think I've seen a few tasks being raised for PHP depend to do that, but to be honest, I have not looked at it in detail. Voilà, bon, on va arrêter les questions. C'est l'heure de la pause, donc euh, allez-y.